Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another jam-packed episode of Mindspace TV, the weekly magazine show that digs down into the nitty-gritty and day-to-day -day running of your business and others where we offer conversation, advice, and an in-depth look at entrepreneurs who are making it for themselves in these tricky fiscal times. I believe our job is to create a safe place for the rhino and other animals to roam freely. Having a little two-year-old that runs around every morning, first thing is he goes to visit his ghost frog. He runs to the fence and he looks for his rhino that comes to visit every now and then. And for, for me, that's, that's what legacy is about. That's what heritage is about. Three years ago, we lost a lot of rhinos, and it was almost crisis management. What do you do? How are we doing? We tried everything. We tried uh, dying rhinos' horns. At the end of the day, it's retrospective. If you've heard a shot, it's too late. So, Connected Conservation came about really through a passion of one of our founders, um, his passion for conservation and his proximity to technology. And in a way, this leads on from uh, the advances that we've seen around the Industrial Revolution. So because of these gains, uh, we saw an opportunity to radically differentiate our approach to conservation. Yeah, we've got a very small window. We've got maximum five kilometers that the guys will come in, shoot a rhino and then leave. So that gives us, on average, half an hour. Cisco and, and uh, Dimension Data have been unbelievable in the way they've reached out and supported the approach. Technology is a huge benefit to us. It's basically our first line of defense. I think our approach to conservation is very different to anything that's ever been done before. And the reason for that is that we are not intrusive to the animals. What we do is we follow the humans. And uh, we're either following or tracking humans at the, at the normalized entry into the reserve that we've done this proof of concept in, or we are monitoring them where they shouldn't be. So uh, what we've done is we've taken some of the leading technologies around cloud computing, uh, Internet of Things in terms of monitoring the, the fences. We've put sensors into the game reserve, uh, thermal cameras into the game reserve, so that what we can do is monitor any activity that is outside of the norm. Um, all of that is brought up into a central control room, leveraging cloud computing, leveraging CCT an analytics, um, and as a result of that, we can very quickly identify where human activity shouldn't be and then dispatch response teams into those areas. Um, and as a result of that, we've seen a, de a significant decline in poaching in the reserve. What we've done in the reserve is we've actually created a number of mesh networks using uh, ubiquitous Wi-Fi connectivity, which allows us to monitor cameras placed in strategic points across the reserve. We also created a low-powered uh, Internet of Things network, which basically monitors the sensors along the, the perimeter fencing, um, as well as allows connectivity from the CCD cameras into the central uh, control room. As a result of that, people sitting in the control room can monitor human activity across the park. Uh, we can. Uh, apply analytics into that so uh, what we're really doing is leveraging CCD and CCTV analytics to identify where people shouldn't be uh, during uh, specific times and that allows us to uh, provide alerts to response teams in the field. I've been in conservation a long time. Uh, I've never seen a corporation so unreservedly come to the party. We've had tremendous success. In the first year of the pilot in 2015 Rhino poaching declined by 96% in the park and in the 27 uh, year time frame we've had absolutely no incidents whatsoever. So absolutely we definitely do see both sectors embracing digital technology and digital disruption uh, at different levels of uh, speed and urgency. So for example in the public sector the uh, engagements are a lot more thorough because I think the implications are much larger in terms of delivering services to citizens. In the private sector, uh, companies are almost approaching this from a race point of view. They feel that they can be disrupted by startups, 
Uh, new technology brings opportunity quite quickly and so they're responding a lot more quickly to the, to the market and to uh, advances in, in technology. So the way that we're assisting clients in their journey in digital transformation is one at a time. And the reason for that is that each organization is unique. Uh, it has its own specific set of criteria. And what we do is we first of all engage to try and determine whether they are being disrupted at the business uh, model level, at the operating model level, or the infrastructure level. Based on that, we determine a roadmap through design thinking and co-innovation sessions. And once we've determined that, we then break that down using lean agile principles to do bite-sized chunks of work delivered every two weeks. Um, and that's the way that we deliver the projects. The other in area of engagement which is uh, not to be overlooked is the significant cultural shift that is required in organizations as they go through this change. And so we also help companies to determine how they take their staff along on this journey, um, dealing with the change and dealing with the advances in technology. I think for me the most exciting thing about the Tour de France is first of all the fact that the Amory Sports Organization has understood uh, that there is this digital revolution happening and so they've made significant advances in moving their company forward not to be disrupted. And uh, basically what they've done is leveraging very basic uh, GPS functionality to provide the location of bicycles, the speed of the bicycle within the peloton have used that basic technology to accelerate the viewer's experience. Uh, the other story behind this is that the gain that's uh, being played out there is all about data. And it's the ability that we have through taking a significant number, you know, upwards of uh, 3 billion data points across the race, 150 million data points per team across the race, geospatial location. We're using that information to enhance the viewer's experience, to ex expose them to the story behind the Tour de France, what energy is being used, uh, what kind of uh, you know, speeds are being achieved, what are the implications of weather on uh, the climbing. The other thing that uh, the Tour de France showcases is the coming together of all of these exponential technologies. So we're using advanced analytics, we're using uh, artificial intelligence and uh, leveraging these technologies we can actually determine who will win the race. We're trying to determine the patterns uh, around each, uh, each uh, part of the tour. So based on those patterns we can determine you know, when, the, when the peloton will see a break, uh, how long it will take for the rest of the group to catch up to the leaders, etc. So leveraging uh, very significant cloud computing capability as well. 
Across each stage we build a mobile network and using this meshed mobile network we're able to gather all of the information from each of the individual bicycles. So all of that information is actually then uh, published through either Twitter or any other uh, you know, various social media outlets uh, and users are, or fans are consuming that data right on the sides of the road uh, to get real-time updates of what's happening within the race. Okay, so I think another significant learning out of our experience around the Tour de France has really been uh, cyber security. What we've seen on the properties that we own like, for example, the Tour Data, uh, the Tour de France real-time monitoring website, is tremendous cyber security attacks. And uh, our, our platforms have been designed in such a way to prevent compromise, but that learning is now being applied to our clients across the world. Uh, one of the most significant learnings out of the Tour was actually the implementation of real-time threat and, and, and analytics. And so because we were able to predict and see uh, threats developing across the world, both in the normal internet as well as the dark web, we were able to respond much, much quicker and thereby bring um, far more robust, secure, cyber secure solutions to our clients across the world. The, the lessons that we're learning in the Tour de France by applying, applying these leading edge technologies are uh, we're then applying them to organizations that we work with every single day and uh, effectively demonstrating to them the benefit of understanding data, uh, understanding data in a real-time fashion, how to leverage that data to respond to the market differently. Uh, we're applying artificial intelligence to organizations, helping them uh, interpret the information in new and meaningful ways. We're using robotics to allow organizations to offload menial tasks to uh, computer-based systems, freeing up their staff to do more meaningful work. Uh, we're using the cloud uh, to enable companies to respond much, much more quickly to the market. Um, and because we're using the cloud as a platform, we're able to introduce new systems uh, into their organizations very, very rapidly. My view on this is that we are only beginning to understand what the implications of the fourth industrial revolution will mean to individuals and to businesses and to industry. Um, there is a very, very exciting future ahead of us where technology is going to enable human beings to do things in far more meaningful ways. The work will evolve into uh, you know, new patterns, new kinds of work, uh, new jobs will be created, uh, significant opportunity will be created and I, my view is that we are only just beginning this very, very exciting journey into the future. Now we're joined by Lamond Kritzinger, who is the Group Assurance Executive at Old Mutual. Lamond, give us a typical example of rising disability claims, so how they come about and the consequences thereof. Uh, Fifi, interestingly, um, sickness and injury are the main causes that ultimately end up with some sort of disability. Um, so it can be anything ranging from you know, a uh, cut or a burn in the workplace, maybe in, in a mining or manufacturing environment, to maybe in an office environment, in financial services, to somebody getting some back trouble or, and not being able to work. So really the dis disability word is a little bit of a misnomer because it's not tr really true disability per se, but it's being off work for the reasons being either sick or being injured and not being able to work. Yeah. Is there a, a typical uh, trend in rising illnesses and exactly how does this impact on employability? Very much so. Uh, in fact, the past few years uh, have there have been some concerning trends, in fact, specifically around uh, lifestyle mm -hmm. uh, that's changing, uh, and, and diet and uh, health and uh, stress, the environment, the economy uh, is really coming through as well. In fact, interestingly, uh, Old Mutual did a survey last year and uh, resulted in a disability monitor 
uh, our first disability monitor and the outcome of that interestingly showed that uh, employers are seeing a lot more stress in the workplace, mm -hmm. uh, a lot more psych sort of mental disorder challenges coming through and then ultimately giving rise to people not being able to work anymore, not being able to cope and then being off work for a prolonged period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then ultimately some of them not being able to get back at all and then being on disability for quite a while. Oh boy, I mean, what is that a function of? The tough economic times or is there something even deeper going on? Uh, absolutely. So, the, in fact, uh, one of our reinsurers did a study a few years ago to show the correlation, the link between the consumer confidence index mm -hmm. and uh, the business confidence index, rather, and, uh, and the number of disability claims in the, uh, in the insurance industry. And it was there was quite a close correlation. So, as, as there are challenges in the economy and companies may be downsized and there are retrenchments, it in fact impacts uh, insurance claims, disability claims specifically. Um, so more people go off and they can't cope. Um, other thing worth mentioning is those that remain behind mm -hmm. when they're downsizing and when there's, you know, the good people remain and the more stress is on them and they were to, they were to just carry the can. So it's sort of a bit of a vicious cycle um, and uh, we see that coming through cancer as well. I also just need to mention there's really been a rise in the incidence of cancer over the last few years in South Africa, we can see. Uh, and that's quite concerning. Also some linkages between stress sure. uh, and certain types of cancer. So these things all sort of uh, overlap uh, and ultimately result in people not coping and they can't work. Mm. How about HIV? Is it still as prevalent? There's a bit of a good news story around HIV actually. The last 15 years or so, we've, in, our, in Old Mitchell, we've seen about a 40% reduction in mortality, so in deaths as a result of HIV. Mm. So the step just before death, of course, is the sickness mm -hmm. and being off work because of HIV. And there we've also had a lot of, a lot of success. So uh, we find now that HIV really, as long as you take your antiretrovirals and uh, you stay healthy and you eat healthily, you should be working. Sure. In fact, the medical experts say that up to 85% of people with HIV should be working as long as they are on their medication and they're compliant. Uh, so that's really a good news story. And, uh, and we're quite involved in that from our mutual perspective as well. Lamont, could you tell us exactly what your primary aim is? So um, I'd have to say we're trying to keep people healthy, but we, we can't really influence that too much. So we're on the insurance end when we have to pay out claims. So ultimately, we're probably trying to get people back to work once they are off work. And we can't do that on our own either. So it really is very much a partnership between ourselves and our clients. So our clients are mainly the, the large corporates, the employers, uh, and the retirement funds, working with them to try and have um, practices and policies in place that actually gets people to stay healthy and be uh, aware of, of how they should be living their lives. Uh, we can't do much too much about the economy, unfortunately, um, and uh, you know we, we sort of at the at the at the end of that. But uh, certainly, there's a lot that can be done. Uh, and from our side, we are what we're doing as well in in, in our mission in terms of what's our. Our main focus would be to, to really focus on our disability claim books. So we have more than 6,000 disability claims every month. Sure. We're trying to get back to work now. Of course, many of them are never going to get back to work. But we, what we've done in the last few years is try and engage much more with them, more regularly. Uh, we're using some um, uh, specialist providers as well to help us with that. And we found that close contact, regular contact, keeping their motivation up, uh, getting them to think and believe that they can actually get back to work. Uh, that's actually one of our primary goals. So we're heavily invested in that right now. And as an employee, when, when do you know that you are entitled to a disability claim? Or how, rather, do you know you're entitled to a disability claim? So that's a very good question because, in fact, legislation's changed uh, the beginning of this year uh, under the Long-Term Insurance Act. It's called the, uh, the Policy or the Protection Rules. And a whole lot of rules, actually, and, the, and the, the nuts and the bolts of these rules is to try and make the individual in a employer all aware of what risk benefits they have. So we do find that often uh, employees don't really know what they're covered for, when can they claim, etc. So um, this legislation is helping insurers also ensure that that's in place um, so that they know what they can cover, cover for. So it really revolves around communication uh, with, uh, with employees, a lot more communication and awareness uh, and also helping them and guiding them through the process when something happens. Sure. You know, not every person who falls ill is going to become a disability claimant. So people go on sick leave and they're off for a while and there's normally a waiting period, what we call a waiting period with our insurance products, you know, before it starts paying. Uh, also that we can make sure that somebody really is, from a longer term perspective, you know, injured enough or sufficiently sick enough not to be able to work. 
certainly for the short term. And that's the thing though, so what factors exactly decide on uh, or determine a person's disability claim? Yes, yeah, so we have some very interesting de de definitions around disability in the insurance industry. Some of them can be quite complex in fact, so just to try and summarise them in a, in a, in a nutshell, uh, we have own occupation definition, so can you do your own job, can you continue to do your own specific job, or we have alternative job definitions, can you do maybe an alternative job if you can't do your own. Mm -hmm. And uh, as an insurer, we look at those definitions, which are in the policy contracts, and they sort of sacrosanct. And if, if you meet that definition uh, sufficiently, then you are deemed in terms of the product that we've sold to the company. You're deemed to be disabled, uh, and you can go off until you can recover enough to come back to work. So it's quite subjective at times too, so that's why maybe my reply is a little bit vague, but uh, you know, you've got to look at the policy contract, mm -hmm. What did the client buy what for their staff? Uh, and does it meet that criteria? So we have a, a large contingent of claims assessors who every day look at the medical reports, look at the facts around the case and say, does this meet the criteria of this definition? Yes, it does, no, it doesn't. The person can go off for a while and then we start engaging with them, as I said earlier. So it's really up to that definition, whether they can work or not. And how about taxation? How has that impacted disability claims? Very much so. In fact, uh, in 2015, there was a very fundamental tax change to disability benefits, um, which means currently, since 2015, the 1st of March, that when uh, if you, are, are, you or I were to go on, on disability, we wouldn't pay tax while we're receiving that insurance benefit from the insurance company. So it would be sort of a tax-free benefit. We actually taxed on our contributions while we're paying. Sure. But once you're on disability, so that has had quite a big impact, uh, Fifi, because one of the things around working uh, and being disabled and getting a benefit is that there needs to be sufficient incentive to stay working. And if it's too easy or too attractive to not be at work, mm -hmm. you know, then that becomes a problem. So we have seen, and this is one of the key reasons for the rise in disability claim volumes uh, over the last three years. We have seen, certainly for uh, the more senior staff members who actually get taxed more, so in fact their benefit if they are disabled is actually a little bit higher. Uh, we have seen that that's been a cause for more claims and that's very concerning. So that actually impacts the price ultimately of the product. Uh, we're all paying more um, and it also, it's also quite a bit harder to get somebody back to work once they start um, not paying the tax once they're at home, <laughs> recovering. So it's really quite a fine line. Fortunately, most of our claimants really want to get back to work. Sure. Uh, but there are some who, you know, don't, don't be like their boss and they'd rather stay at home. Or, or whatever don't even the, whatever like their the, job. Yes, whatever the reason <laughs> might be. Uh, Lamont, talk to me about what the relationship owner is and their exact role. Uh, a very important role, in fact. So in our industry, the relationship owner is generally the consultant or the broker or the advisor, it could be a whole lot of different stakeholders. And, and these are, in our value chain, these are the role players who look after the interests and the needs and give advice to our clients. And when it comes to a claim, they're also there as a partner to ourselves to make sure that we are uh, fulfilling on our promises, that we're providing good service, that we're looking after our client and the claimant as best we can. And we do a lot of reporting, in fact, in our business on claims for all our clients. How many claims there are, what the causes are, what the trends are, are there spikes in certain causes of disability. Um, so very much a partnership approach that we have uh, from our perspective with our intermediaries and our consultants. And then the book price. Uh, how exactly does that impact on the premium that uh, I would pay for disability cover? The book price, we have a very large book in Old Mutual. And if I can maybe explain it in a way to say that uh, we've worked out that in a, in a book of, let's say, 100,000 uh, clients, members, mm -hmm. uh, we will have 100 claims. And then every year we see how many we ended up with. Was it more than 100, less than 100? And uh, that number actually determines then the price that we set for insurance mm -hmm. for 100 members next year. Of course, it's not an exact science because history doesn't always predict the future. Uh, so it's a little bit of an art and a science in trying to price accurately. Uh, for, for group schemes, um, business that can be quite volatile, you know, as we mentioned earlier, when the economy changes. Sure. If that's one of the reasons for more claims, we, might not have we wouldn't have predicted that uh, necessarily. We didn't predict the tax change in 2015, mm -hmm. uh, etc. So these things are quite volatile and quite fluid, but we do a lot of work on the pricing side to ensure that we price sustainably is the main word that we use, because you know, things can change every year, but really we want to get it right in the longer term uh, so that things don't chop and change too much.
I mean, in this realm of a volatility, how exactly can uh, one control costs? So one way of controlling costs is by trying to prevent claims, because it's the claim that we're paying for. Uh, so there, everyone really has a responsibility, from every staff member, every, every member of a retirement fund mm -hmm. who's got risk benefits. The employer, employer's got a massive role to play, uh, to raise awareness, to maybe have well-being programs, mm -hmm. um, and communication drives. Uh, and really not just talk about this, but actually to put it into action, because the disability monitor I spoke about earlier also showed last year that there's a lot of awareness from employers that they need to do certain things and take action, but mm -hmm. in terms of taking action, the, the levels are a little bit lower. Uh, and there has to be a focus on this. So uh, really my answer would be to retain, to, um, to contain costs. We need to reduce claims, and to reduce claims we need to be healthier and look after ourselves and try and manage stress levels and get the economy going and get people positive and that's a little. Well ladies and gents, that about wraps it up for this evening. Remember to join in on the conversation on social media using the hashtag MindSpaceSA. Until next Thursday, it is ciao for now.